Let me tell you, people like Tom make it look easy to stand on the stage and to give a word. And I'm telling you, it's not easy to give a word like that. You labor over it. You grieve over it. You carry it, and it's a burden. And I appreciate that obedience. And as you were speaking, that's exactly what Shirley said. Look at myself. I'm full of pride. I'm full of rebellion. It might not be what other people think, but we all know what that is. I don't want those things in my life. And I know no one else does either. I think one of the most painful things to do is not when you read the Bible, but when you let the Bible read you. And you see what's really there. And you drop the mask that you're carrying and the facade that you want everybody to view you as. And you just let the Bible tell you what's there. I encourage you to do that this morning. Because you've got a problem. Everyone say that. I have a problem. Some of you believe that. Some of you don't. You have a problem. You have a dilemma. There's a question that you're being asked this morning. I'm going to tell you, there's no way around the question. Up until about 2,000 years ago, this question had never been asked. But ever since then, Every person that's ever breathed and take up, took up space has been forced to answer this question. It's inescapable. It's important. It's pressing. It's unavoidable. To ignore it is to answer it. To act like it's not there is to give an answer. To postpone it is to answer it. The question I'm asking this morning, and it's not a question coming from me, it's a question coming from the Lord. You will answer this question. Some of you have already answered it, some of you haven't. The question is, what will I do with Jesus? What will you do with Jesus? When Jesus Christ came into a humble manger just over 2,000 years ago, it was more than a Messiah and a Savior entering the world. A question entered the world that will forever be posed to every human being born. What will you do with Jesus? Some people have given a loud, resounding, I'll give it all. I'll serve him. Others have given the, uh, I don't know. I'll think about it. Others have given the, uh, I'm not going to follow him. I don't like that path. But I'm telling you, you will answer the question. How many times in school growing up, I was put on the spot by a teacher waiting for an answer that I didn't have to give. That awkward silence because I didn't know the answer. Everybody in the classroom staring at you. But let me tell you something. This is a personal question. It's a question that your neighbor beside you cannot answer for you. It's a question that the masses can't push you to do. It is a question for you and you alone. And nobody else. You will answer this question. And I'm not trying to be hard this morning. I'm trying to be honest. There is a question that you will be forced to answer. What will you do with Jesus? It all started with a virgin girl. Luke chapter 1. 
verse 26. It says, In the sixth month, the same angel, Gabriel, was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph to the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the virgin, How will this be since I'm a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with who, her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. What is that about? Mary is the first one to be asked this question. What will you do with Jesus? The angel came to her and gave her a word that was unbelievable. Unbelievable. She's the first one to be asked this question. What will you do with him? And she gave a resounding answer. Was she scared? Sure she was. Did she want her lifestyle to change? No, because once she answered that question, it was forever to change. She said these words, Be it unto me according to your word. Her answer to the question of what will you do with Jesus was, Be it unto me. And we saw many responses to what you will do with Jesus in the Christmas story. And this isn't necessarily a Christmas sermon. I mean, Joseph wrestled with the question, what will you do with Jesus? He was the betrothed. He wrestled with it. I'm going to put her out quietly. Then an angel came to him, and he, he reasoned, and he said, I, I will receive him. I'm not going anywhere. The shepherd's response to what will you do with Jesus, they came and worshipped him. The wise men. They sought after him to bring him honor. See, once you know, you are asked that question and there's no escaping it. And I wished I could say that everybody made the right decision, but they didn't. Herod tried to kill him. His decision of what will you do with Jesus, I will destroy him. I want no part of him. You see, once you know, the answer is in your hands, and you're forced to answer it. Over and over. What is the Bible? Well, it's God's word to man. But let me tell you what the New Testament is. It's people, one by one, giving the answer to the question, what will you do with Jesus? One by one. Coming. The innkeeper did not make room for him. The disciples left all to follow him. When Jesus said, come follow me, what will they do with Jesus? See, the question was now theirs. I'll leave my family business and my family. I'll leave house and home and everything for him. I'll do it. The Pharisees didn't have that answer. And just because they gave a different answer didn't mean they didn't answer it. They answered it just as resoundingly. We will not accept him. We will try and destroy him. We reject him. Over and over again. See, the crowd said, what will you do with Jesus? I will follow after him for his miracles and his words. The centurion came 
What will you do with Jesus? I understand his authority. The rich young ruler came. What will you do with Jesus? He says, I will leave because I can't sell all. So I'll leave bitter. I don't want to pay the price to follow it. The persistent widow came and was asked the question, what will you do with Jesus? I will keep knocking. I will keep pressing until I get a hold of him. That's what I'll do with Jesus. Over and over they came. The lady with the issue of blood, what will you do with Jesus? I will press through the masses because I have to touch just the hem of his garment. I've got to get a hold of Jesus. What will you do with Jesus? Nicodemus, who we spoke on last week, what will you do with Jesus? I'll betray the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees because I see something real there. We know that he's sent from God, so I'll seek him out. What will you do with Jesus? Lazarus accepted the resurrected life that Jesus had to offer. The woman caught in adultery had a life change when asked with the question, what will you do with Jesus? Will you continue to live in the lifestyle you're living or will you take the new life that Jesus is offering? You see, the question has been asked and it's being asked to you today. What will you do with Jesus. Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 27. It's not an accident. I love it. Matthew chapter 27. I want you to look what happened to one individual when he asked the question. Now at the feast, verse 15 of Matthew chapter 27. Is everybody following me this morning? Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner they wanted. And they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. A notorious prisoner called Barabbas. We've got lots of notorious prisoners. You think of Ted Bundy, think of Jeffrey Dahmer, Charlie Manson. You think of all these notorious people that's known for these heinous acts. That's who Barabbas was. He was the worst of the worst. He was the bottom of the bucket according to their society. So when they gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you? Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Christ? The name Barabbas, we don't really quite grasp it. But I want you to think about it in terms of our modern day, okay? Let's just pick Charles Manson, who I saw on the news last week. He's getting married. Good for him. Apparently she saw something. See, that's proof. Everybody has somebody. It's terrible. There's, I'm getting, I'm going to digress here. But I want you to picture this man with the upside down cross tattoo right there on his head. Committed all these heinous murders. Had this family in this cult. You got him on one hand. And there's a custom in our culture today of... We get to the festival, and I'm going to release one person to you. It's nothing new that was done. It was done every year. That's the culture. So we've got this notorious criminal, Charles Manson, over here, upside down, cross tattoo, committed all these murders. And right beside him, I've got Jesus Christ, who the Pharisees have arrested and put in jail because they're jealous of him, because they made the decision when asked, what will you do with Jesus? We will get rid of him. We will conspire against him. And now they've come to Pilate, the governor, and they've said, hey, it's now time for the custom to be done. Release for us a prisoner. 
You got Charlie Manson here, and you got Jesus Christ right here who is innocent. And Pilate says, Who would you have me release? You know, expecting in his human mind. Well, obviously, the, the lesser of two evils, I don't know anything about Jesus, but I've seen this Barabbas fellow time and time again in my court. He's notorious. Everybody knows the name Barabbas. And expecting them to say, Jesus, obviously, Barabbas is a terrible criminal. Keep him locked up. We don't want him out on the streets. They said, give us Barabbas. Give us Barabbas. Release Manson. Keep Jesus locked up. Give us Manson. I, I want him walking around the streets today. I want him living in the house next to me on my street. I don't know what he does, but it's better than having Jesus out there. I'm not trying to make light, but this is what happened. And Pilate, the question was his turn now. The question that every person had to answer, the question that you will have to answer today. He asked it publicly, what am I to do with Jesus? And if you could hear anything I say this morning, I don't care if you leave here and think, that's the worst sermon I've ever heard, keep it to yourself, but... Hear this one question that I keep asking time and time again. It was Pilate's turn, and now it's your turn. He says, what will I do with Jesus? That question has been asked for 33 years at that point. And now it's Pilate's turn. And in shock and awe of, give us Manson, he says, what? You want this guy? What am I to do with Jesus? And the crowd yelled in unison, crucify him. Let him be crucified. Think about this situation. They're letting a heinous, notorious criminal on the loose. We want him to live amongst us again, but this man of innocence, crucify him. But it was Pilate's decision to make. Here's what I want you to take from that. The crowds will always be telling you what to do with Jesus. But let me tell you something, you alone are accountable for that decision. And no one will answer it for you, nor will anyone make you give an answer except God. So the crowds were yelling, crucify him. And even his wife came to him of the question, what will I do with Jesus? She says, have nothing to do with him. I, I was in much turmoil last night and many dreams because of this man. Have nothing to do with him. Let me tell you something else, married person. Your spouse cannot make that decision for you. No one can make that decision for you. Your parents can't make that decision for you, teenager. I think one of the toughest times in life is when you get to that age where you're about to leave high school. And I think we still have this culture somewhat. When I was a kid... There wasn't a question of if you went to church. That is kind of changing a little. I went to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and if there was a prayer meeting, we were there. And if there was worship practice or anything, we were at church. I remember when I turned 18, what I had given all these idle threats for my whole life that I prayed my parents didn't remember. Well, when I turn 18, I'll do this. I'm like, Please have a short memory. Let me stay. <laughs> Don't kick me out. I want to stay. 
don't make me come through on those promises. I just want to stay home with mom and dad. But I remember when I graduated, and really, that question was posed to me and me alone. It wasn't my parents' faith anymore. It was mine. And I remember when that question was asked to me in my spirit, and I knew it was being asked of me. Richie, I'm not asking about Rick Clendenin. I'm not asking about Eugene Peel. I'm not asking about J.T. Parrish. I'm not asking about anybody else. I'm asking you, Richie, what will you do with Jesus? And I gave the answer that, God, I need you. I don't want to live somebody else's faith anymore. I need you myself. See, Pilate was being pushed from all sides. Crucify him. Have nothing to do with this man. From the bride, from his wife. I find it interesting that Pilate tried to push the off, push off making the decision. What was his response? He sent him away to Herod. In other words, that was his answer of saying, I'm out of this. Somebody else can make that decision. I'm fine just the way I am. Just leave me alone. I find it interesting that it went to Herod, and then where did it fall back at again? <laughs> right back to Pilate again. Why? Because you can't escape the question. You can try. And you can run. And how good of a job we do running from it. But I'm telling you, church, and I want you to hear me this morning and hear me clearly. The question is in your lap today. What will you do with Jesus? What are you going to do with him? Pilate was pressed. He tried to push it off on somebody else. Tried to let other people make the decision for him. But it kept coming back to him. And in verse 24, it says, So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, this is his response. He took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I'm innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourself. You can wash your hands of a lot. And I do it 30,000 times a day. Either by laborious hand washing or by antibacterial stuff. Which I'm getting more and more convinced does nothing. <laughs> but we still use it, praise God. You can wash your hands of a lot. You can wash your hands of germs. You can wash your hands of dirt. But you can't wash your hands of the question, what will you do with Jesus? You can never get away from it. It started with Mary. And we've read story and story and story after story of how each person responded to the question. And now it's at Pilate's. Here we are, 2,000 years later. The question still remains. It's interesting. There's a lot of things that change over time. I've noticed as my hair has grown out, now I have this gorgeous comb over. By the way, you've been worn the comb over. I'm bringing it back in style. There'll be photo opportunities after church. A lot of things change in time. I notice as my hair is getting longer, there's this gray stuff <laughs> coming in. And in my beard, there's these gray patches, these wrinkles. I'm enlarging in areas, growing hair in areas that's like, what? Hair comes out of that now? Ears and such. A lot of things change over time. 
culture has changed tremendously even since I was a kid. Prices of things go up and down. Technology is constantly changing, pushing something new in front of our face. Once you get something, I'm just pretty much convinced by the time you get it home, it could be cutting edge in the store. By the time you get it home, it's obsolete. But there's one thing that will never change. And it has never changed. It has stayed the same for 2,000 and some odd years now. It hasn't changed at all. It hasn't been gone through a metamorphosis. And it's being asked of you today. What will you do with Jesus? Because I'm telling you to say nothing is an answer. To ignore it is an answer. To postpone it is an answer. So my question is, what will you do with him? Will you accept him? Isaiah 55 says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found, and call on him while he is near. Will you reject him or deny him? Matthew 10 says, Whoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father who is in heaven. That is a terrifying verse. I think the most tragic, terrible words that we could ever hear is, get away from me. I never knew you. All because they answered the one question wrong. Get away from me. I never knew you. Will you accept him? Will you... Deny him. Will you turn your back on him? I'm telling you, you are seeing more and more. What's going on in our culture today? You are seeing people answer this question wrongly. The schools have answered the question, we want him out. What will they do with Jesus? We want him out. government has answered we want no part of him society's trying to get him out of the holiday that marks his name society wants no part of him culture wants no part of him government wants no part of him education wants no part of him regardless of what decision they make I'm now asking you What will you do with Jesus? Because it's no more difficult to answer if the entire world says, I don't want it. It's not one of those things where majority wins. Okay, I don't need your vote. Because it's a personal question. And it's your question. It's a question that every person must answer. These few points and we're finished. It's a a question that every person must answer. Say that with me. It's a question that every person must answer. My second point is this. It's the most important decision that you will ever make in your life. There's a lot of important decisions that you make in life. None of them will even come close to this decision. There are people that spend more time looking at a menu, deciding what they're going to eat, than the thought they put into this question, what will I do with Jesus? That's a tragedy. It's the most important decision you will ever make. It's a question every person must answer. My third point is this. It is a question about Jesus. What do you mean by that? It's not a question about will I follow all these rules and regulations. You're not making a decision of am I going to go to church for the rest of my life? Am I going to be this kind of person? Am I? You are asked this question. It's not a question about a religion. It's a question about what will you do with Jesus? 
It's a question about Jesus. And you're being asked it this morning. And there's no way to escape it. If he is who he said he was, then he demands your all. If he's not, then Christianity is the biggest farce the world has ever created. It's the truth. If Jesus is not who he said he was, then we are to be pitied amongst all people. If it's wrong, then I'm going down with the ship. But I know that's not true because Jesus is Lord. And if he is who he said he was, and I'm telling you he was, And he is, and he forevermore will be the king. Answer this question correctly. What will you do with Jesus? Because he's calling to you this morning. Do not ignore that question one second longer. Don't act like you're not being asked it, because you are. You are being asked it, and it's not by me. What will you do with him? What do you believe? I don't care what you feel. I don't really feel anything. You don't have to feel. I'm asking you, what will you do with Jesus? It demands a response. It demands a response. And you're giving one if you realize it or not. And so am I. Jesus, I know that you are who you said you are. I believe every word in that book, God. And really this season is not really celebrating what we think it's about. It was really the coming of a question that every person has been asked ever since then. And you're asking it of us today, what will we do with Jesus? Lord, I've asked that question a lot because I want it seared in the spirits of every person in this building. What will they do with him? What will I do with him? I've made my decision, Jesus. To ignore it is unacceptable. It's an answer. To postpone it is an answer. It's time that we stand on our feet and we give the answer that's correct. Lord, I want to accept you. I have accepted you and I will follow you. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. I have decided. To follow Jesus, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning. Let's stand to our feet. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back.
cross before me. The cross before me, the world behind me. The cross before me, the world behind me. The cross before me, the world behind me. No turning. decided I have decided to follow Jesus just one more time. I have decided. I have head bowed and every eye closed, I want to ask you this question one more time. What will you do with Jesus? What will you do with him? Because it's a dilemma and it's one that you're facing right now. What will you do with Jesus? It's the only question in your life that carries eternal benefits or eternal consequences, everything else will be gone. That is the only question of eternity. If this morning I've been talking to you and you know that I have, and you know that God's talking to you this morning, and you want to respond to that question, I'm ready to follow Jesus. I've been struggling, and I'm ready to give it up this morning. I'm ready to give it all to Jesus. I'm ready to answer that question. If you've not answered that question and you're ready to this morning, what will you do with Jesus? If you're ready to accept the Lord this morning with every head bowed, I don't want to embarrass anybody. Just slip your hand up right now. Just slip your hand up right now. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see those hands. Church, let's pray this prayer together. Dear Jesus, I accept you. That's what I will do with the question. I will accept you. I will not run. I will not hide from this question any longer. I accept you is my Savior, and I will live for you as my Lord. Jesus, I believe that you are who you say that you are. I believe that you are who the Bible says that you are. You are the King. You are the Savior. And from this moment on, you are my Lord. And I receive you in my life. And from this day on, I will answer that question 
with a resounding, I will follow you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing it one more time. I have decided. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided. talking about that tonight at church. Love on somebody as you're dismissed this morning. We'll see you tonight at 6.30.